So welcome, I am Janelle Weekly, Multimedia Collections Manager at the Arizona State Museum. We are here today to interview the photographer and author of many books about the people and places of the Southwest, Stephen Trimble. In 2019, Stephen approached me as he was looking for a repository for his photographs of indigenous people. These photographs are taken for his book, Our Voices, Our Land, Talking with the Clay, Navajo Pottery, Traditions and Innovation, The People, Indians of the American Southwest, and the 20th anniversary edition of Talking with the Clay. And then in the spring of 2022, Stephen brought his photograph to the ASM. Greg Arduño has been organizing and cataloging Stephen's photographs. And as part of her internship, she agreed to conduct this interview. And so Gray and Stephen, I invite you to introduce yourself, and then Gray will, can start the interview. Well, I'm I am Steve Trimble, Stephen Trimble, on my book, Steve Trimble for my friends. And I'm a writer and photographer. I grew up in Colorado and went to Colorado College and then went to the University of Arizona for my graduate work in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And uh, Finished a master's degree, worked at the Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff for a couple of years, and that kind of launched my career as a freelance writer and photographer, which I've been doing ever since, since 1981. My name is Gray Garduno, and I'm a graduate student in the Museum Studies program here at the University of Arizona, and I've been working at the Arizona State Museum for the last eight months with Janelle. Um, starting the archival process for your collection that you've donated. So I've been, you know, cataloging, creating an inventory and organizing your work. It's been like a lovely, you know, opportunity to to work with it. The images are really beautiful and I've learned a lot through your work. And I'm curious now that I've like worked and looked at your work, it it seems that you've had a lot of amazing experiences, you know, in your work as photographer, writer, and editor. So I'm curious why you wanted to pursue a creative path. That's a big question. Um, I don't really think of it as a creative path. It's just what I love to do, I would say. Uh, I grew up with a father who worked for the U.S. Geological Survey, and my dad, Don Trimble, whenever we would take family vacations around the West, which we did at every opportunity, he did a running commentary about whatever was going by out the window. Uh, not only geology, but human history and natural history. He was fascinated by the West and that landscape and the history of that place. And so I grew up thinking that landscape had content and that the coolest thing in the world to be would be a park ranger. And so I got a liberal arts education at Colorado College, but the very first thing I did out of college was volunteer for the National Park Service, and that led into being a seasonal park ranger at parks in Colorado and Utah for several seasons. And I had always taken pictures. I had started taking pictures when I was a little kid. My dad gave me an old camera and critiqued my very first role when I walked up and down the street taking pictures of people, our neighbors' new cars. And uh, my dad was not a professional photographer by any, by any means, but he had, he had a good eye. And um, he was someone who always tried to educate and to make people understand and to make everyone's work better. And so I grew up taking pictures of my family vacations and my trips up skiing in the Colorado Rockies. And then in, in college, all my mountaineering and, and wilderness hiking trips to just bring back stories. I felt the same way about writing. I, I was a passionate reader as a kid and couldn't imagine anything cooler than having readers for what I wrote. And so by the time I got to be a park ranger, back in those days in the, the 1970s, the park service uh, would hire local rangers to write those little interpretive booklets that you buy, 32 page booklets that um, you buy when you go to a park to learn all about its human and natural history. And so I was able to be hired to write a couple of those books when I was really serving my apprenticeship as a writer and photographer for Great Sand Dunes in Colorado, for Capitol Reef 
in Utah, and eventually for a half dozen other parks across the West. And that's how I served my apprenticeship as a writer and photographer, and that kind of led toward bigger and bigger projects. So I'd say my, my work as a writer and photographer just grew out of my, my love for the West, my interest in telling stories, my interest in sharing my experiences, and sharing my, my love and enthusiasm for the place and its people, and trying to bring everyone else along with me to enjoy and revel in those experiences of this extraordinary place that we call home. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. I, it sounds like, you know, through like the experience of your father and his connection to the landscape really, you know, formed yours, you know, so it's really, really lovely to hear about. Um, so obviously you've spent a lot of time, you know, in the West. So when did you start building relationships with indigenous communities? So when I was, um, this is actually great because it, it, we're kind of going chapter by chapter to get us to the to the photographs that you all have. Um, and so as a park ranger, I was writing about the West with a liberal arts degree, not a lot of training in, in ecology particularly. And I began to think that I really needed to know more than I knew to do that authoritatively. So I decided to go back to graduate school and ended up at the University of Arizona at the U of A and realized fairly quickly that I wasn't going to be an academic. I wasn't going to be a research biologist. There was way too much, uh, way too many differential equations trying to turn the natural world into uh, predictable and um, ways of understanding what was going on in the natural world that we could study. I just wanted to observe and revel and describe. I was a naturalist, not a scientist, but I, I managed to get a master's degree. And not long after that, uh, decided to move to Flagstaff and began to do work for the Museum of Northern Arizona, where initially I was a contributing editor to the magazine Plateau and doing whatever I could to make a little bit of money, helping out with paleontological research on doing field work. Um, but I began to learn a lot about publishing and design and marketing and books, but I was not yet doing a lot, doing any work at all in tribal communities. Uh, I was still writing about national parks and landscape. But at, at that same time, in the late 1970s, there was a curator of anthropology at the Museum of Northern Arizona named Robert Brunig. And Bob became a friend. And the museum went through a huge upheaval and transition in 1980. And basically all of us lost our jobs. And uh, I decided I would then become a freelancer. And I had some other projects that were landscape based. I was working on my big book about the Great Basin, the Sagebrush Ocean for University of Nevada Press, when I got a call from Bob Brunig. And Bob had become the curator of anthropology for the Heard Museum in Phoenix. And he was beginning to work on redesigning all of the native people's exhibits in the, in the herd. And he had the idea of opening those exhibits with a slideshow about contemporary native people in the Southwest. The idea would be that it, as a visitor walked in, you would listen to the voices and see the faces of contemporary people before you walked in to see the artifacts from generations and millennia of native people in the Southwest. And Bob decided that I was a guy that should work on this. He had seen my pictures and my writing over the years. Uh, I had done some traveling in Southeast Asia after I lost the job in Flagstaff, where I really began taking pictures of people for the first time. Uh, travel pictures, pictures of, of uh, indigenous people in, in Nepal, Burma. And Bob called me and asked if I would uh, help with this project. And as the project evolved, I became the guy who was going to travel across Arizona and New, and New Mexico really intensively in the summer of 1984, doing interviews with people in the tribal communities to get these voices that we needed for this three screen slideshow. And as I did so, I, I photographed. And um, it was really, the answer to your question is, is most simply Bob Brunig. Bob gave me this chance. That was an extraordinary opportunity and honor and I spent weeks in that summer of 84 
making sure that we had every voice we needed and talking to all kinds of Native folks in reservations and in uh, urban situations from Albuquerque to Phoenix. And after I would interview someone, I would photograph them and I would seek out events and rodeos and ceremonies where I could photograph and bring all of that back to our voices, our land, which became the name of this slideshow. And we mixed together my work with the landscapes taken by Harvey Lloyd, uh, an eminent New York photographer who did a lot of aerials of landscape and put it all together into the slideshow, which eventually became a book and a calendar and lasted as a slideshow at the herd for years and years and years. So that was really the beginning of my work in Indian country. And uh, it was it was just a joy. And so once I got started, I kept going. Yeah, that's really apparent in your work. I think it's, I love that you called yourself a naturalist. And it seems like, and what I've recognized through your work is like just the, like the passion and like interest in relationships and building relationships and like having connections with people is really, really apparent in your work. It's really lovely. Um, I'm curious, like how you approached, you know, going into these communities, communities as a visitor, like how did you start um, building those connections in a way that was, you know, conscious and respectful? Yeah, that's a key question, Gray. Um, I think it helped that I was coming basically as a naive listener. You know, I was not an anthropologist. I had no nothing to prove, no theories to prove or disprove. I was very much there to listen to Native people. And I had a list of themes that we wanted folks to talk about. You know, for instance, we wanted to hear a Hopi person talk about corn and a Navajo person talk about sheep and uh, Colorado River tribes talk about their relationship with the Colorado River. And I would often ask questions that just let people tell me what they think we should hear. And so I would show up in, um, you know, in an old truck and I, I kind of costumed myself to look neutral with a blue work shirt and jeans, you know, never wore shorts, no matter how hot it was. And uh, I used a, a blue journal like this, along with my tape recorder, nothing fancy. I've been using these for years and years and years. And um, I'd knock on people's doors. And so I, I had a few names from the herd, people who worked at the herd who were already working with Native people in the, in the tribal communities on this, this project. And so many times I would have a, a single name at a reservation and I'd start with that person. That person might be an educator or someone on the tribal staff or an artist. And I'd interview them. And then and my last question would always be, who else should I talk to? And then I go keep knocking on doors. You know, in those days, many people didn't have phones. And it really meant going door to door and asking for directions. Uh, my favorite set of directions was, go down that road and turn left where the windmill used to be. Um, it was it was really a total adventure, but I would basically just present myself at a doorway and say, you know, I'm Steve Trimble. I'm working on this project. I'm looking for people who can tell stories about your your community, your people. And uh, so and so recommended me. I wonder if you have a few minutes to talk. And sometimes people would just open the door and say, sure. And other times they would be a little bit more hesitant. Sometimes they would say, well, this isn't a good time. Can you come back in a week or another time or in a month? And uh, I, th I always, always felt like that was a test for me. They knew that they lived in remote places. To, for me to come back in a week or a month was going to mean hundreds of miles of driving. But I, if I came back, they almost always relented. Um, if I didn't know anyone in a community, I would often stop at the mini mart at the crossroads entering the village and whoever worked at that mini mart, usually a woman, obviously knew everybody. That was that was the uh, you know the village green for for villages like this. And I would start chatting with whoever was behind the desk at the mini mart, and often end up interviewing them. And then I'd ask them who I should talk to. And after an interview, listening to whatever people wanted to say to me, I would often ask them to uh, allow me to take a portrait of them, and take them behind the building into open shade and 
take one of those pictures that you've been looking at, Gray. Um, that's how a lot of those pictures came about. And I, and I would also look at the bulletin boards on those mini marts to see if there were any ceremonies or events or rodeos or anything scheduled where I could photograph more freely at a public event, take lots and lots of pictures. Yeah, that's really, really beautiful. I'm glad that you shared kind of your approach and, you know, how you really communicated what you wanted to do and who you were and your intentions, you know. It's interesting to hear about the process, you know, of knocking on doors and, you know, finding these places just because it's it's a really different world now, you know, mm -hmm. and how people connect and like the reality of technology. And so it's, I think it's really inspiring actually for me, you know, I have a photographic background as well. And it kind of like inspires me to be able to, to kind of bring that back, you know, and to approach work like that. It's really lovely. You know, um, people are, people are um, flattered. People are flattered when you ask them to tell their stories. I, in, on another project, I called up somebody that I was hoping to talk with and I called him cold, told him I was working on this book project. And there was this long pause and he said, I've been waiting for your call. You know, he was just waiting for the chance to tell his story. He yeah. had no idea who I was, but he was waiting for the call. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's like, I think people want to be heard and seen, you know, in their experiences. And I think giving people that opportunity, you know, especially communities, you know, that have been marginalized. And I think it's great, you know, that you've illuminated these stories. I want to like keep, you know, talking about this ideas of, you know, the stories and, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of your work, it's really like so apparent, you know, it's like, and since there's multiple images, you know, I get to kind of track the narrative as I look and I, you know, obviously I have what I think, but I would love to hear about, you know, some like photographs that like are really, that stand out to you and as far as important stories. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're right, Gray. I, I really am a storyteller. I don't think of myself as someone who is creating art. I'm not, I don't have this boiling need to create my own vision of the world. I call myself an editorial photographer. You know, I'm telling stories with those pictures and often pairing them with what I've written. And, um, and so I want the pictures to have content, whether that's content related to the history of the place or content related to the, the spirit and the stories that someone have, has told me. And so that, that's why it was so much fun to photograph people after I'd heard their stories, because you know we had established a little bit of a relationship and I could often kind of get them to give me a little sparkle in their eye because we had just been chatting and joking and, and shared something. We had a relationship. And so that's what I was trying to get in those pictures. Um, and as you said, many of the experiences were were building on experience. Uh, the the most powerful, absolutely the most powerful moment of all of those, was working with Philip Casador, who was a San Carlos Apache medicine man. And Philip had been working a lot as an advisor to the Heard Museum during the Our Voices Our Land project. And so I had met him. He was very much uh, aware of what the museum was trying to do and really wanted the museum to tell the story of an Apache girl's coming of age ceremony. And so I found out that there was, gonna, and, the, and those are public, you know, I was at White, I had I'd seen a, a little notice at White River on the, um, on, the Fort, on the Fort Apache reservation that there was a, a coming of age ceremony, a puberty ceremony coming up. And then I learned that Philip was going to be there uh, too, as one of the, one of the medicine men, not, not one of the primary medicine men you know, telling this, this, the Apache creation story to the young woman, but he was going to be there as sort of a participant. And so he agreed to be sort of my sponsor. And so I went to White River and the ceremony was four days long. And I was able to just be in that circle of folks from the village photographing the whole time. And I was never introduced, but it was apparent that I was with Philip. And at some point I, I asked Philip, you know, is it really okay to be taking all these pictures? This is a very intimate thing that I'm participating in here because I was kind of right in the center of things and often very close to the young woman and the line of medicine men behind her. And he looked at, looked at me with a little twinkle in his eye and he said, 
you know, you've been taking all these pictures for days and no one told you not to take the pictures. You have a nonverbal release, essentially, from the entire village to take these pictures. And um, it culminated with the series of pictures I took on the last day when the young woman, Jeanette Larzelier, was painted with earth by, by a young man with an eagle feather and yellow clay. Uh, you've all seen, I know you've seen the pictures, Gray, but I'm sure many of the people listening to this eventually will have seen pictures of young Apache women just covered with earth. They're wearing white buckskin dresses. And by then, uh, Jeanette had gone through days of ceremony and going back to a teepee at night and listening to the Apache creation story. And she was really be becoming sort of, you know, transformed. And um, the last few pictures I took of her with her eyes closed, covered with her, I feel like those are the best photographs I've ever taken. And it, it was, you know, I very much led up to that in my own experience of the, of the ceremony, uh, just watching and really just watching and watching for every moment that looked like it was going to make a strong photograph. The other thing I really loved about working for, um, for the herd and also for my big book, The People, I'm kind of mixing stories together from those two experiences. I loved tell telling the stories of tribes that most people know nothing about. You know, the Wallapai, the Yavapai, the Kokopa. You know, most people in the Southwest can tell you a bit about Pueblo people or Hopi or Navajo or even Apache. But, you know, in all of my work, I've started knowing pretty much nothing about what I was going to write about or take pictures for. Uh, that's true for most of my big projects, which kind of fuels me. It gives me the curiosity to just keep going and learn more and more. Uh, if it's something I already know a lot about, it seems way less interesting. And so telling the stories of these little tribes, you know, the Paiute tribe of Utah, that, whose stories are just not out there in the world, and we don't see pictures of those, those folks, that, that was exciting. So w one way to answer your question about telling stories makes me think of going to the Wallapai Reservation at Peach Springs. And the herd had um, sent me there to photograph for Our Voices, Our Land and given me a little bit of money to pay people for their time. Um, I think I was paying the people I interviewed $12 an hour. It was the only time I had money like that. Usually I, there was no money exchange. But the, uh, the two women who ran the Wallapai Education Department, Cindy Watahamaji and Melinda Powski, took, they took, took me on as a project. And they set me up with appointments with all kinds of different people in Peach Springs for two or three days. And I was able to go from the tribal chairman to a parole officer to one of the elders who didn't speak English at all. I went with, a, with Melinda, I think, as an interpreter to another elder who told me stories of her grandmother that she was repeating from when she was a little kid that took me, took me right back to the middle of the 1800s. And each time I would photograph the, the folks after I interviewed them. And all of those voices and sounds, that they, they became a very big part of Our Voices, Our Land soundtrack. And I remembered them with, um, with a lot of emotion, I'd say. Uh, there was one one elder who, you know, didn't live much longer after that, named Bertha Russell. She was the woman who told me stories from her grandmother that took me back to the forced march of the Wallapai down into the desert when people were whipped to death. And she would tell the stories as if she were there. And it's, it's her face that is the frontispiece in, in the people. Um, just incredibly powerful moments that that build into a story of a people we know very little about in the outside world. Um, I, I have it here. I'm curious if you can like talk about just like how the project of the people got started, what it inspired you, and just a little bit about the process. Sure. So our voices, our land began all of this. And by then, by the time I was working on that, I had moved from uh, Flagstaff to Santa Fe. And as I finished that summer of 1984, that all that intensive field work, I was back in Santa Fe, walking around the plaza, and I happened to see in the window of Ortega's, one of the, the uh, Indian art shops on the plaza, an Akima pot 
with a mountain lion petroglyph painted on the pot, which was what I was using as the logo for my business in those days, my little freelance business. So I went into the, to the shop and talked with the manager, uh, Maria Goler, and in the course of talking to her and telling her that I was really drawn to this pot by Maurice Chino because of the connection of the petroglyph to my work and to my logo, uh, I told her what I just spent the summer doing and she said, well, you ought to do the same thing for pottery. You know, we have no book about Pueblo pottery that is an interview based book. You just did all these interviews. Why not interview the potters and make a book about Pueblo pottery? And I thought that was a great idea. I just had this fabulous experience. So I uh, took that idea up to the School of American Research, which is what it was called in those days, up on the hill in Santa Fe, and um, talked with them about maybe publishing a book about Pueblo pottery. And they said, well, yeah, that's a great idea. So I got a contract and plunged into my next interview based project in Indian country, which became talking with the clay, the art of Pueblo pottery. And I did a, I did a similar thing. I ended up interviewing about 60 potters from Taos to Hopi and let them tell me their stories and how they dreamed their designs and learned from their grandmothers. And I had always loved Pueblo pottery. Um, my parents not only were taking me on those trips to, to national parks from where we lived in Denver, where I grew up, but they were also taking me down to Santa Fe. My mother especially loved Santa Fe. And, you know, they bought a couple of very simple Pueblo pots that had always been in our homes. And when I was in college, I loved going to Santa Fe and uh, soaking up whatever I could learn about Indian art, Navajo rugs, Pueblo pottery, Navajo silver, Hopi silver. And so the, uh, the idea of doing a book on pottery really appealed to me. And so that was my next big project, not as massive as the people became because it was focused on one group of folks. But again, just a, a, just a lovely chance to listen to amazing people and take pictures of not only them, but their extraordinary work. Um, as I was finishing that project, I got a call from an old friend who, uh, whose name is TJ Prees, and he was the director of what was called the Southwest Parks and Monuments Association in those days, one of these cooperating natural history associations that worked with national parks. And he was very much aware of, of the work I'd done in national parks earlier, and um, he had moved from the Grand Canyon to become director of, of this natural history association that was sort of a, a, a umbrella organization working with many national parks in the southwest they're now called the western parks association and tim said well you've just done these interview projects why don't you just extend it to all southwestern tribes and write an introduction to southwest indians for us and he would publish it that was a big daunting task but i was really, on a, I was kind of on a track at that point. I had learned how to do this. And I thought, this is an amazing opportunity. I have a publisher. Of course, I would do it. I'm a freelancer. I can say yes. And so I began that project in the late 80s and started crisscrossing the entire Southwest, um, working on this book for, that would become a book published by what what the acronym then was SPMA, Southwest Parks and Monuments Association. And that meant talking to people in 50 different tribes, an even bigger universe than the folks that I had talked to for Our Voices, Our Land, and would require much more diversity of voice. You know, at any given uh, reservation, I'd really have to talk to enough people to give, get a sense of what was going on in that culture right now in the late 80s and early 90s. And then do enough archival research in libraries to be able to talk about who the people were, where they came from, what their history was, a little bit about their ethnography. Um, again, I was, I was not an anthropologist. I was writing for, for general audiences, trying to capture photographs that told the stories of the people adequately and, and uh, grippingly and beautifully. And Kept, just kept going and kept turning in my work to Tim, Tim Prees, and um, ended up with a very long manuscript, which you know how big the book The People is. And 
uh, was deeply chagrined when my publisher told me after I had created this entire thing, well, this, this is all great, but we need you, you need you to cut it by half. It's too big for our needs, for our purposes. And I said, I, I, I'm not willing to do that. I just gathered all this incredible material. It's still just an introduction, but it's a, it's a huge subject. It's, you know, the Indians of the Southwest, everything from Mexico North to Four Corners. And so I took the book back from that initial publisher and took it back to the School of American Research, now called uh, the School for Advanced Research, SAR Press in Santa Fe, and asked if they would publish it. And they said, you betcha. And so I was able to publish the book in its original format. It really, it's almost too big. You know, we, we talked over the years about splitting it up into three books, a book about the the people of the mountains, the people of the Colorado Plateau, the people of the deserts, but we never did it. It remains a big book. And um, I think people who use it and read it probably dip in and out of it. If you're traveling in Navajo country, you read the Navajo chapters. If you're traveling in Southern Arizona, you read about the Oatam and the Yaqui and the Apache, and that works fine. So the people grew out of these other projects we've talked about. And it was really the culmination of those projects. So how long did you work on that? How many years? The people? Well, it was published in 1993. And because it was building on the other projects, I always think of it as sort of a continuum. So it's about 10 years from yeah. that first summer in 1984 to the publication of The People in 93. Wow. Yeah, it's really wonderful. I love that it's it's really accessible, you know, and to me, as I've been looking through it, that's really apparent. And I think the, how you write about it is really beautiful. And also just the images, you know, I think it's, it's really, it's been a great just experience reading it. Oh, thank you. It's now, you know, now it's, now it's kind of dated in some ways, but yeah, I just, I just reread the introduction and, and uh, with some prescience, I said, this is a snapshot of the Southwest Indian world at a particular moment in time, which is exactly what it is. And there's been, there've been many changes since. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a good kind of segue into an important question. I feel as far as right now, you know, there's like a reckoning that a lot of photographers and critics are having as far as just looking at the history of photography, the medium of photography, you know, as far as it's kind of its tool, you know, in the colonization of people. And I'm curious, you know, what, how you feel about these conversations as someone who has worked with these communities for many years. Yeah, I'm, I don't yet have, have a complete answer to that, Gray, because I'm not working in Indian country right now. Um, you know, when I was doing all this field work, the people that I was talking to, Native people, Call themselves Indians almost always. Uh, one one person said to me, "Yeah, we call ourselves Indians. Anthropologists call us Native Americans." And um, you know now, an Indian is obviously a misnomer, but that was the identity, the word used to describe identity for so many of these folks. And so I and I, I I'm well aware that it's a a word that is not particularly approved of these days. Indigenous and native are far, far more accurate and better. Uh, Indian country still seems to be used even by most young, fierce native people. Um, and other than that's, that's just strictly language. But I think I, I don't think I could do these books today as a white guy just showing up on people's doorsteps. I think older people would still talk to me. But I think a lot of I think the book should be done by young, fierce Indian people. If anything like this is going to be done, you know, there's a gorgeous new history of Native America uh, just published by Ned Blackhawk, who teaches at Yale. And that's that's the kind of book that we need now. Um, but the books that I did, I really felt like I was a messenger kind of going out into the remote places that I visited and taking the time to listen to people and bringing those stories back. And I did that as a, as a writer and photographer. And I felt like I was doing it. I happened to be white. I could have been native. It would have been a different experience if I, if I were native, but my readers were likely to be white 
or non non Indian, non Native, and so I could sort of serve as a an intermediary or interpreter. I really like the word interpreter. It's a National Park Service word, but it it feels um, like it describe feels to me like it describes a lot of what I do, and. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't attempt to do the people now. I think that it really is it's um we've gone beyond where a white person should do a book like that, even if I could do a book like that. I guess the one exception would be, you know, I've always, I, when I did talking with the clay in 1987, I had the chance to go back and do a 20th anniversary edition in 2007 and update the book with a whole new generation of potters. And the last line of my introduction is, I look forward to swinging back through Pueblo country for the 40th anniversary edition, which would be 2027. Um, I, I, I'll talk to this to SAR Press about that. And I think I could do that. I, I could go back and talk to the potters. Um, and that would feel appropriate. And uh, I think I would be accepted. I've, you know, I, I have occasionally gotten in trouble by being a clueless white guy, but not often. I've, I've mostly found people pleased with the the work that I've done, Indian people pleased with the way that I've used their images and words. So it's really tricky. I'm not I'm not immersed in that that revolution in sort of decolonizing the way we talk about Indian country. Um, if I go back to work on a, a new edition of the pottery book, I'll I'll have a better answer for you. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing your experiences and just what you feel has changed and kind of your relationship to it. Now, I think, you know, you you bring up an interesting reality as far as like that you wouldn't approach, you know, doing a book like like these, you know, now. And, you know, I think what seems to me, at least, as of what is important is really giving, you know, Indigenous people like an opportunity to share their own narrative and be in control of that. Um, with that said, I'm curious about, because it seems like you're saying, you know, what you've expressed is that you didn't really get a lot of, I don't know, people upset with the way that you approached it. And I think it's clear, you know, in your work, as far as the importance of like connection, you know, and just like what is obviously just your, your energy, you know, and how you approach, approach people. But I'm curious if now, like what relationships you still have with these communities and what time you've spent. Um, because I was covering so much territory, I, I didn't spend a lot of time in any one place. And so uh, some of the potters I, I ended up being very friendly with and, and maintained communication and, um, you know, we chat a little bit on Facebook, some of them, but for the most part, these were very fleeting experiences that I think of as incredibly powerful and important to me. I think most of these people have forgotten all about me. Um, you know, the people with such a big book, I couldn't send it to every one of the hundreds of people I interviewed. I, I hear little stories back. The most recent one just touched me incredibly. Um, the cover of Our Voices, Our Land, which is this book here. You know, it's this girl at uh, San Juan Pueblo, Okea Wingue Pueblo, uh, dancing for feast day. And uh, at feast days, you know, I could buy a photo permit and photograph freely. And I, I learned that in between rounds of dancing, a lot of the dancers would hang out behind the kiva. And that was a great time to photograph. They, the kids would play on the staircase. Uh, other older people would just sit around and chat and they were fine being photographed. And I took a picture of this little girl. I asked her mother if she'd sign a release form for Our Voices Our Land. So I learned her name was Myla Garcia. She was six at the time. And uh, I've always loved the picture. Uh, unfortunately, that particular picture is one of the very few that got lost over the years. You, you guys only have a dupe of it. You have other pictures taken in the series, but that particular image is, is gone. But, um, you know, I've always loved the picture. And that was taken in 1984. And just two or three years ago, 
I noticed that Myla Garcia was following me on Instagram. And it was an unusual enough name that I clicked on her and it turned out to be the same Myla Garcia, you know, who's now, now in her 40s. And she had posted uh, on, on feast day at Okeo Inge, she posted a picture of herself dancing today and a picture of the cover of Our, Our Voices, Our Land and said how much she loved the connection back to her childhood. And so I sent her a message and said, you know, I saw it and that was really cool. And she wrote back a lovely note saying that uh, she was always very proud of that and that, and we both agreed that it carried a lot of spirit of the, the Pueblo families that just kept teaching their, their new generations how to participate in ceremonies. So that, that was one moment of connection that I, I just loved. And things like that, that happen occasionally. Um, but many, many people that I interviewed and photographed in those days, you know, many of the elders are gone. They were gone soon after I talked with them. And my PO boxes for people from 1987 or 1991 no, no longer work. Um, so the, the people in talking with the clay are the people I have the longest connection with because I went back 20 years later and talked with them and their grandkids, their children and their grandkids for that new edition of the, of the pottery book. But there's a, dis, there's a disadvantage, you know, some people call it parachute journalism when you just plop in out of the sky and spend a bit of time, intense time interviewing and photographing and writing about a place and then you disappear. And, uh, you know, there, there certainly is a, a little bit of antagonism about photographers, especially coming in, taking pictures and then making a lot, making a lot of money off the photographs that doesn't get back to the, to the reservations. Um, these books didn't make a lot of money, so I never felt too bad about that. And even my stock photography business did not make a huge amount of money. I always donated to the Native American Rights Fund and the Indian Law Resource Center, American Indian College Fund, you know, tried to tithe back from the profits I did make, but um, I, w I never felt too badly about that accusation because I wasn't, I just wasn't making that much money off of these photographs. I'm curious if there's any other images, you know, that really stand out to you and what you've donated to the museum. Sure. Um, well, there, there, obviously there are many. Some of the, some of my favorite pictures I love because I just nailed it graphically. You know, I, I was able to get that decisive moment and compose a picture that I think is really just a beautiful photograph. Uh, some of those may or may not be crucial to the storytelling. I, th I think, I think of those almost in a different category. You know, when I'm telling the story, there's a lot of content that I'm trying to communicate. Every once in a while, the content and the, and the kind of graphic image of the picture come together perfectly. Uh, there's a picture of a Hopi farmer, uh, Eugene Sikakwaptawa, in the uh, Eagle Clan cornfield. And I had interviewed Eugene, and he took me out to the cornfield below Oribe so I could take some pictures. And he had a red bandana that um, he wore against his gray hair. And I ended up taking one picture in a sequence of pictures where the shape of the bandana tied mirrors the corn stalks blowing in the wind just kind of perfectly. And I, I love that picture because not only does it tell the story of a Hopi farmer, best dry farmers in the world, working in this, this you know, clan cornfield below one of the oldest continuously inhabited villages in North America, but it's also just a really nicely composed photograph. Nice it moment. is. I love that photo. I have been, you know, selecting images to digitize, you know, for the museum. And that's one of them. It's a really like there's multiple, but they're really beautiful. There's also um, the photographs of Hopi corn that, mm -hmm. I've, that I've seen are, are really lovely as well. Yeah. And those are I'm not sure if you're thinking of the same ones, but tight shots of blue corn mm -hmm. and red corn. Yeah. And again, those are. They're kind of storytelling pictures, but I also get to play graphically. I was able to do that a lot in the pottery book and, you know, take tight shots of these incredible designs that the potters have made and, you know, make my own decisions about how to compose 
a photograph of a detail of those pots or a dramatic way of lighting them. And uh, it's great fun. It's really, really fun. There, there's one photograph of a potter that also occurs to me toward the end of the people, a, a photograph of Jenny Lino um, sitting in her kitchen at Acoma Sky City on top of the Mesa, the old village, where her husband was the designated uh, protector of the village for a season. And um, the very first pot I bought for myself when I was 20, taking those picture, pic, trips in college, I bought one of her pots at, a, um, at an Indian art store in Albuquerque, which man, I have somehow managed to have all these years without breaking and all of the moves that I have done. And so it's a, you know, it's a fine line Acoma pot. I had no idea when I bought it who had made it, but many years later, I ended up interviewing her and photographing her, and she just emanates the the warmth of Pueblo women in that picture, and with all of the the things in the background that kind of capture what it feels like to be in a Pueblo kitchen with a, you know, I think there's a a, a, a rug with Jesus on it and ceremonial objects on the wall, and it's just a, this kind of melange of what what it kind of means to be a, an Indian person. I loved the photographs, um, a lot of just different, you know, obviously potters, but other indigenous artists too, you know, working in different mediums. It's been really lovely. And I've done like, you know, I then take the information that you have and I Google it because I want to know more about them. And so it's been a really amazing process and just learning more, you know, so I really am grateful for the opportunity, you know, to work on your, your work. Well, thank you. you. You can do your research more easily now than I could when I did these projects with the okay. access to the internet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm curious, um, just in your desire to, you know, give the Arizona State Museum part of your collection. Well, what I gave you are, are slides, obviously. Um, these date back to before the digital revolution in photography. And so I had always imagined that in in the, in those years, I made my living primarily as a stock photographer, uh, submitting my pictures for guidebooks and textbooks and magazine articles and calendars and that sort of thing. And in those days, you would send in the slides, and if, if a publisher chose to use them, they would reproduce the picture and send you back the slide, and you could send it somewhere else, and they would pay you a, a fee. Um, I always imagined that would be my retirement income, that I would have this vast a uh, collection of images that I could just keep selling over and over and over again. But when the internet came along and flooded the world with images, many of them for free, stock photography just basically disappeared as a profession for me and for my colleagues. And uh, my filing cabinets filled with tens of thousands of slides became something I had to figure out what to do with. I wasn't getting inquiries for pictures. Uh, I haven't, I sell just a few, I make virtually no money from my photographs anymore, even though I use them for my own projects. And so I knew that these pictures, especially the photographs I had taken in Indian country for these projects that we've talked about, they're now historic. You know, we're talking 40 years ago and more. And um, that's a long time. And the pictures are, are special. And I, I couldn't imagine just leaving them in those filing cabinets and having them, you know, be there when I die and have my kids just, you know, dump them. That seemed like it would be tragic. So I began to look around for a place to donate the archive. And as Janelle said, uh, when I contacted her in 2019, I was kind of talking to my friends in the museum world about where these should go. And I talked to a number of museums. I wanted to keep them in the Southwest so that they would be accessible to native people, to the people who are in the pictures and their families. So I mostly talked to museums in Arizona and New Mexico. And many people said, we just don't have adequate storage. Um, some museums were, were more interested than others. But when I contacted Janelle, she was very interested. And as she said at the beginning, she said they had this new state of the art way of actually preserving the images. And uh, very important to me, she mentioned that they have a, a consulting committee of Native folks talking about what 
what the appropriate ways are to, to use and publish and reproduce these images. And all of that appealed to me. And so Janelle, Janelle and I were having these conversations as 2019 bled into 2020 and then the pandemic hit. And so everything was put on hold for a couple of years. I wasn't gonna be doing any traveling to get them down there to Tucson from my home here in Utah. And uh, over time, all those other museums that I had talked to just kind of disappeared. They weren't pursuing it, but Jan Jan Janelle and I did pursue it. And so we worked out a time for me to put all my bankers boxes of slides and put them in the car and drive them down to Tucson about a year ago. And I'm delighted. I am so pleased. And I was a little concerned about all of those New Mexico images ending up in Arizona, but as it turns out, Janelle has, has assured me that that's totally appropriate. And in getting a glimpse of your pottery collection at ASM, that's very clear to me that it's appropriate for all that New Mexico Pueblo work to be with you. And of course, because I am a graduate of the U of A with a master's degree, that makes it especially sweet. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephen. It's been really lovely to talk to you and get to know you a little bit. And again, it's been really great to work on your on your photos. Well, I am I'm honored that you all spent so much time, you know, doing what you need to do to make them usable. I know that there are a lot of photographs there, and uh, doing what you're doing, Gray, is just a huge, a huge uh, contribution to making them have a long life. And thank you.